Gracious Father, this morning as we fellowship around your word again, may you break your bread for us, O God, that we may understand, assimilate into our system. And we give you all the glory, Father, as we partake of you and realize that if we possess Jesus and have him alive in our beings, we possess everything. Lord, make this truth a reality in every lightest life. We ask all this in Jesus' most worthy name and all lighters say, Amen. You can be seated. If you are here for the first time, we are in a mini-series called Financial Health. This is part two. If you have missed the first foundational lesson, you could get a CD at the counter. Just by way of recap, the first lesson of financial health is financial health begins with spiritual health. Therefore, you know, spiritual health is more important because when you have spiritual health, then you can cope with the power of finance and position and all that goes with success. Our focus, the main focus, I should say, of a Christian walk is to build a relationship of love and trust with the Lord Jesus. Not just for salvation, more than that, for every aspect of our life. Build that relationship of love and trust. And as you do, you discover that God's word is indeed the absolute truth. He keeps his word. Just to elaborate the first lesson about financial health begins with spiritual health. Psalms chapter 1. Let's read the first three verses. Now listen to it as if you're hearing it for the first time. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We don't go by the system of this world. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Nor seateth in the seat of the scornful. When we become worldly, we become very critical especially critical of godly and righteous things. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. This should be our focus. To have the word of God in our minds, in our hearts, all the time. So what will happen if you do that? Verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What a graphic picture. A very fruitful tree by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Not all at once. There are seasons. It takes time. His leaf also shall not wither. A tree that is planted by the rivers of water is always evergreen. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In short, when you don't follow the ways of the ungodly, but rather you follow the ways of the Lord, not only do you have spiritual health, but you will automatically have financial health. The longer I live on this earth, the truer this maxim becomes real. It's amazing. And I know some of you out there, you find this to be so true. God has blessed you beyond your wildest 
imagination. And it has to do with your spiritual maturity, your spiritual health, that the financial wealth chases after you. Let's go to Joshua, first chapter. Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You partake of it all the time. It doesn't go out of your mouth. You're always living by the word of God. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Again, you have that expression, day and night. You live by the word of God every living moment that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You don't just hear the word of God. You are a doer. You apply God's word. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. It's all about spiritual health undergirded by the Word of God. You live by it. It's a guarantee, but not all at once. In due season, so says the psalmist, in due season. Oh, you can start out as poor as a church mouse, but when you observe to do all that is written in this book, you will be rich. In due season. Then go with me to Proverbs the 10th chapter. Verse 22. It's a wonderful verse. An obscure one, but very relevant to our subject. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord. It maketh rich. And he addeth no sorrow with it. Many people can testify that when they become rich, troubles come along. Marriages are broken up. I've read a story about this guy who struck rich by lottery. He was a happy man, happily married, in quite a good job. Not poor, but well-to-do. But when he became super rich, trouble came. He could not hinder it. His marriage broke up. Became a drunkard. Oh, a lot of sorrow with wealth. You know why? Because no spiritual health. Just financial wealth came along. He could not stand it. But here, the Bible is saying, when the blessing comes from God, it makes you rich, but there is no bitter aftertaste, no accompanying sorrow. Why? Because you have spiritual wealth. Now we come to the second lesson on financial health. Eternal wealth outlasts financial health or financial wealth. Eternal wealth outlasts financial wealth or health, if you like. Profound truth about health and wealth is all found in Jesus Christ. I know that statement strikes you as simplistic, especially when you have not gone the distance with Jesus Christ. Sometimes we say Christ is the answer. It seems so simplistic. Unless you have a profound relationship with Jesus. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. Then he contrasts his coming by saying, but I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just life, but abundant life. Right here on earth, you will possess all that you need if you truly 
believe me and walk with me. When you are alive in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is alive in you, it's not a simplistic statement to say that you have everything you need. Physical health, spiritual health, financial health, eternal health that is everlasting life, eternal wealth that is your position in Jesus Christ as king and priest. You have all that you need, but you don't get them all at once. We have eternal life right now. All of us do have. That means the moment we pass away for one reason or another, even right now, we enter into heaven. So we have eternal life. But we don't realize it now because we are still here. But we have it. We have it. See? The potential of all of you becoming very strong financially is always there as long as you are in Christ. But as in everything with God, there is a God word, there is a man word. You got to cooperate with Him. You got to walk with Him. And you can realize all your noble dreams. And that's the absolute truth. Let's take the example of Abraham. Remember, he was under the old covenant. We are under the new, which is a better covenant built on better promises. But even though he was in the old covenant, he was the one who got everything started. He, he's a father of faith. The moment when God called him out of the paganistic society, Earl of the Chaldees, he exercised faith and obedience by obeying God to get out of his homeland and from his relatives and from everything familiar and to follow God. That moment he entered into a relationship of love and trust with Jehovah God. It's the same principle. And then God made to him, as he took those steps to walk with God, God made to, to him staggering promises. God said, I'll make you a great name. But he had no son and he was in his old age. God said, I will bless and multiply you. But he had no son at that time. God said, your descendants will be as numberless as the stars in the sky, as a sand on the seashore. But he had no son. A great nation will be birthed from your seed. He had no son. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Do you know up to today, it comes to pass. You look at people like Hitler. He died a horrible death because he persecuted the Jews. You mark my word. You look at every nation that is against the Jews today. You can mark it down today and see what will happen to each one. And isn't it very telling that facing all the hostile nations surrounding it, the nation of Israel still stands today. If people cannot see that that's a miracle, they must be blind, dumb, or deaf, or just plain dishonest. It's a miracle nation because God has kept his word to Father Abraham. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who cursed you. Do you know why Singapore is so blessed? When everybody deserted us, when the British took off, when our neighbors were hostile, when we were defenseless, the Jews came to help us. Help us build 
our army for which we are indebted and always thankful to and we always produce I will bless those who bless you pray for the Jews every day you be blessed I always try to remember to pray for them every day especially to open up their eyes so that they will see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah the Savior the Lord the healer and deliverer and then God spoke to Abraham in your seed all nations will be blessed Galatians tells us as long as we believe in Jesus Christ we are children of Abraham the Christian message has gone to all nations of the world yes even in the Arab nations there are faithful Christians all nations are blessed because of Jesus Christ and when we are in Christ we are the children of Abraham you see how all those promises have come to pass they didn't happen immediately Abraham had to hold on in faith and in patience each step of the way but in his heart eternal wealth was top priority with him did you know that he was a very wealthy man the Bible says so one of the richest men on earth in his time but Abraham had the perspective of eternity and wealth on earth eternal wealth took first place in his heart how do I know recorded in Hebrews the 11th chapter the chapter on faith and verse 10 for Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God he was very rich God told him out of your seed will be a great nation you build a nation with cities but oh no he looked for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God that is top priority in his heart but everything follows suit now was Abraham dreamy and impractical and lazy after all God promised him so much oh no he had a proper perspective of a life in the light of eternity God came first in his life all the time although he was so rich God was number one all the time Abraham possessed material wealth a lot of them but material wealth never possessed him he possessed possessions but possessions never possessed him the priorities of his life were balanced and that's my prayer for every lighter that you have a balanced priority of life turn with me to Luke 16 chapter in verse 13 Luke 16 13 says no servant can serve two masters and remember we are all servants of God but no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold on to one and despise the other you cannot serve God and mammon or God and money you can you got to serve one or the other you serve one and make use of the other either you serve money and you make use of God or you serve God and you make use of money again let's look at father Abraham when he went out of earth he made a mistake he wasn't supposed to take any relatives except his immediate family in Genesis we are told and Lot went 
with him. You know, friends, there are some people that shouldn't be part of your life and heritage. You let them tag along, you have a lot of trouble. Oh, I learned this lesson quite some time ago. The Bible says, Lot went with him. Lot wasn't called, wasn't meant to be part of his entourage. But Lot went with him. Abraham allowed that. And because Lot went with him, he had a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. <laughs> because he allowed Lot to come along. And very soon, trouble began. Lot's men and Abraham's men were quarreling over grazing ground. And so a parting of ways must come. But look at how Abraham behaved. Abraham went to the nephew, Lot, and said, let's not quarrel over this. If we have to part, let's part peaceably. I tell you what, look at all the land around us. You take first choice. Pick whatever land you want. We will go the opposite direction. Abraham was the uncle. But you see, he wasn't hung up on material things. Lot, you choose first. I will go where you don't want to go. So Lot looked around and his eyes were fixed on the fertile plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot picked Sodom. At first, he was outside Sodom and then he was at a gate and very soon he was inside. So, they parted ways. And then sometime later, the enemies of Sodom and Gomorrah attacked the cities and Lot was being captured. Did you know that Abraham did say, see what I told you? Serve him right. No, he decided to rescue Lot. So with over 300 trained men, they defeated the enemies and rescued Lot and took back all the loot, all the spoils of the battle stolen by the enemies from Sodom and Gomorrah. And the king of Sodom came to Abraham and said, Abraham, thank you so much. You can keep all the loot, all the spoils of the battle. And you know what Abraham told the king of Sodom? I will never take so much as a thread of cloth or a shoelace, lest people say, the king of Sodom has made me rich. I want people to know that it is God Almighty who has blessed me and not man. He refused. You look at his detachment from material things and yet God blessed him so richly. Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 19th verse to 21 says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth. Now Abraham knew he could not bring anything with him when he goes into eternity. You see, we got to live with that end in mind so that we'll never be covetous. You get me? You came empty-handed, in fact naked. You will go home empty-handed. As far as physical things are concerned, you'll be very blessed over there. There'll be a different system altogether. But that is not 
one speck of material wealth you can bring over the other side. So hence the Bible says, do not lay up treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21 is a clincher. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm asking you this morning, where is your heart today? The irony is this, when your heart is fixed on God, material things that you need follow you. And with no bitter aftertaste. But when you fix your heart on corruptible things, you may get them for a while, but troubles follow. Where is your heart? When your heart is fixed upon God and all the eternal wealth, you will not be so tight-fisted when some relatives are in need. You know what to do. There is no habit of trying to hoard and hoard and hoard things. For what? Crazy things are happening in the world. Politicians, instead of blessing the people and protecting the people, are hoarding by the millions of dollars. For what? In fact, don't talk about billions. If you have some millions, another one million doesn't make a diff anymore. It's like you cannot sleep in two beds in one night. So what if you've got ten beds? You only sleep on one in a night. Some of you say, yeah, but pastor, I could jump from one bed to another. Then it will be a sleepless night. <laughs> you can only take, what, three meals or four a day. And that's it. No matter how delicious the food is. Of course, you've gone to a buffet, isn't it? And you try to make your money worth Right? We are all guilty of that. Come on, don't look innocent. You try to make your money's worth, but after some time, no matter how delicious all those dishes are, you don't want to look at them again. <laughs> See, there is a certain limit you can go, but there are many other people who are in need. That's the point of this message. Where is your heart? If your heart is fixed on God, you can never be poor. Never. You can start poor, yes. But as you build up, you can never be poor even if you want to. It's a strong statement, I know. But that's the credibility of my God. Now we come to a passage that's going to Said you thinking. I talked a little about it last night at the miracle service. And I know some of you have read the passage already. Mark the 10th chapter. 17 verse onwards to 27. And when Jesus was, was gone forth into the way, there came one running. Not walking. He was so anxious, so eager. One running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master. Now the word master is actually teacher, a guru. Not master of the universe. Or the word master we use for Jesus. You're the master of everything. It's only good teacher. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. 
Now, we stop there. Immediately, there are a few questions in your mind. This young ruler obviously didn't know the Savior. Hence the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he caught Jesus' good teacher. And that's why Jesus replied him, Why call me good? If you recognize me only as a man, why call me good? Because the Bible says there is not a single person who is righteous. No man on earth is totally righteous before God. So if you address me as a good teacher, and of course you know there are still people today saying that, oh, yeah, Jesus was a very good teacher. Very sad he was being crucified on the cross. He was a good man, but not God. See, the same uh, perception of Jesus, even up to today. And this young ruler had exactly the same perception. You're a good person, a good teacher who, who teaches us good things. So good teacher, I want to learn from you. So Jesus immediately tried to clarify with him that if you recognize me only as a man, no matter how good I am, a man can never be good enough by himself. Everyone born a sinner. You understand? So Jesus wasn't trying to say, I'm no good. He wasn't trying to say that. It was in response to that man's perception. So there is none good, but only God. But if you recognize me as God, then you can call me good master. Because I'm God. See? So this man obviously didn't know the way to eternal life. He even didn't know the truth about God and man and salvation. He don't, didn't know any of those things. Then in verse 19, Jesus said, Thou knowest the commandments. And Jesus mentioned only a few. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And 29, an amazing answer from this young ruler. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all this have I observed from my youth. Now let me first clarify that Jesus wasn't, wasn't trying to say that salvation is by good works or by trying to keep the law. No, Jesus wasn't trying to say that. But of course we got to understand that those who are believing and trusting God's plan for salvation and when they get saved, they love the law. Don't you love the law, those of you who are born again? Honor thy father and mother. Right? You know? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love God with all of your heart. We, we love the law. But salvation can never be purchased through the obedience of the law because none of us could obey the law fully. And that's the truth. So Jesus was not going into that anger that when you keep the law, then you have eternal life. That wasn't what he was trying to drive at. But this young man said, I have kept all this since I was a youth. Now Jesus didn't even rebuke him. How many know that Jesus will come to your level and slowly bring you up? Jesus knew he was sincere. But sincerely wrong. Hence, many people in our day would say, why do we have to believe in God or believe in any religion? So long as my heart is good, I am not afraid. And I always like to ask them, is your heart all that good? Is good by your definition as best as you know how? My, one of my aunties used to say, what about Thailand, what about he? Meaning, I have never murdered, I've never set, you know, anyone's properties on fire. So why should 
I believe in anything. My heart is good. But if I were to ask her, have you told a lie? She'll be in trouble. Have you thought of an unrighteous thought? Are your motives all the time good? See, we're all in trouble. Because according to God's standard, Jesus once told a shocked audience, so long as you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery. Say, wow. Hey, listen. Some of you say, but it's not fair. Sometimes God thinks deeper than us. Do you agree with that? Sometimes one unsuccessful, ugly person say, you look at my neighbor, always committing adultery. Yeah, but this ugly fella, if he had a chance, he would, but he didn't have a chance. <laughs> now, I'm try, I try not to go to, I'm g giving you an idea. You know what I mean? I'm giving you an idea of how God thinks. You see? So, no one can keep the law. None. Absolutely none. So, when that young man said that, I've kept all this since my youth, Jesus was very gracious. Verse 21, Then Jesus beholding him, loved him. And that's the way Jesus looks at pre-believers today. Even people who say, I have a good heart, why do I believe in religion? Jesus look at them. That's all they know. That's the best they know. They are sincere, but sincerely wrong. So Jesus beheld him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now notice the phrase, treasure in heaven. Jesus didn't say, sell all you have, give to the poor, and you'll have eternal life. Give away, and you will have treasure in heaven. Do you know every time you give, you are laying up treasures in heaven? Your rewards will be more in heaven. But in this case, Jesus didn't say, you're going to have eternal life because you cannot purchase eternal life with good works. You get the point? And come, take up the cross and follow me. And I'm sure you are thinking of other questions now. Is salvation by doing good works? Jesus said, one thing you lack. And I believe Jesus was trying to say that it's a main thing that is holding you from releasing yourself to God and believing God fully. One thing. Because money, possession, wealth is your God. His possessions were possessing him. He trusted wealth more than he trusted God. Wealth had become his God. Now that's the point Jesus was trying to make. If not, everyone had to sell all we have, give to the poor, then we have eternal life. The interesting question is, the 12 disciples of Jesus, were they told to do the same thing? No, they only left the house to follow Jesus, but they went back again whenever they could. We're going to see that in clarity afterwards. Go sell, give to the poor. Let, let me clarify, look at it carefully again. Did Jesus say, go sell all you have and give all the proceeds from all that you have sold to the poor. Now think carefully. Jesus said, yes, sell all that you have. Then Jesus said, give to the poor. Did Jesus say how much to give to the poor? Remember when Peter confronted Ananias and Sapphira. 
Peter said, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? When you sold the house, all the proceeds are yours to keep. But why did you lie? You gave everything to the church when you kept a part. In other words, you can keep a part if you want to, but don't lie that you have given everything. You understand the context now? See, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Doesn't mean go sell all that you have and give all the proceeds from the sale of all that you have, give to the poor. Didn't say that. See, like some of you, you liquidate some things and part of it you have given to a good cause. You understand? Not everything. Because if Jesus had said that, he must also make all his other disciples do it. His 12 closest disciples didn't even do that. So that was not Jesus' intention. Now the question is, why did Jesus ask the person to sell all his properties? I can only make a guess here. You know, there are some people who are very rich, but asset rich. Have you met people like that? I have. I mean, they have properties, stocks and bonds, all tied up. And little cash. And when these people come to you and say, hey, can you pass me one grand? Loan it to me. You look at him, oh, <laughs> you're going to borrow from me? <laughs> I mean, you own that building, you know. Yeah, but he's all tied up in assets. Why? Because the, the, the game of his life is like playing Monopoly. You, you just hoard. You just want to get, 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 you know, and fix it on the assets. And you don't want to sell because you say, property price is going up. See, I'm going to get more. You know, now it's three million. They say it's going to be six million soon. You know, but I'm going to get this one. This one is a good buy on block sale. So I'm going to get it now, you see. So he's got no money. But all the time, he's a servant of Memon. Such a person cannot serve God. Some of these people, if you look at them, you don't even know they are millionaires. They even sting on themselves. For what? I don't know. Well, time is passing by. Now remember, a millionaire is never a millionaire if he doesn't spend part of his millions. If he doesn't enjoy his earnings. He lives below the standard of an ordinary executive. And there are people like that. So if he stinges on himself, you bet he stinge on giving to those in need that he can reasonably help people close to him even he will even turn a deaf ear to the mom's plea for money, why? he's going after that unit that has unblocked potential <laughs> are you getting it? And probably this guy is like that. So tied up in assets, not liquid enough to help himself, let alone other people. And Jesus knew that the only way to get that guy who is a, a, a slave to material thing is to make a drastic change in his life. Sell all that you have. Because this guy was possessed by possession a frenzy accumulation attitude all the time little to live on nothing to sow little to live on but nothing to sow so when Jesus said that to him verse 22 and he was sad at the saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Some of you in your other translations say he had great properties. Now listen, owning property is not wrong. See, just like eating is not wrong. 
But every time you eat a horse, it's wrong. You know what I mean? Owning property is not wrong, but if you're hoarding and hoarding and accumulating for what I don't know, you even suffer, you know, stinge on yourself and even your closest loved ones who looked up to you for help. But you are so tied up. That's wrong. Then Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Now first we have to establish what is the eye of the needle. Now Jesus is saying it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now the eye of the needle, if we take it literally, is that little hole, little pinhole in the small needle where you put your thread through. Don't talk about a camel going through that. Even your little finger cannot go through that. It's impossible. But why did Jesus say that? Well, a lot of commentators are saying that the, the eye of a camel is the ancient expression of people in Palestine referring to the side gate next to the main city gate. You know, they call it the eye of a camel. It is for those without any excessive goods and animals and cameras to go through. You, you may say it's an express lane. Have you been shopping and they say, you, if you have less than three items, you have an express lane. You don't have to join the crowd who buys the whole supermarket. Have you ever go shopping and then in front of you, this lady, he buys the whole shop. If you are behind her, you'll be there for ages. So if you buy two items, you go through that express lane. So this eye of the needle is an express lane for somebody who travels light. But very small gate. Usually that person got to bow and squeeze himself through. And for a camel to go through, the camel got to be trained to go on its knees and walk on his knees. To go through the eye of the needle. And incidentally, if you want to be saved, you've got to be humble enough to be on your knees so that you can go to heaven. So Jesus is saying, and it was very difficult for those days for camels to go through that express lane, but some people wanted to cheat with one camel and they trained their camels to push through. But it was very, very almost impossible. So the disciples knew it was that side gate, but it was very difficult unless it's a very small camel. And, but Jesus in verse 27, looking upon them, saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Now you get that perspective already, isn't it? If that young ruler were to listen to Jesus Christ and if he had gone and saw all that he had, remember he didn't have to give everything. Jesus didn't say give everything. Jesus said sell everything, yes. Drastic action for a very drastic habit. Greed of accumulation. If he had done that and gave part to the poor, you know what would have happened? In Proverbs 28th chapter, verse 8. Proverbs 28 verse 8 says, He that by usury, the practices of a loan shark, that is, and unjust gain, 
increases his substance, he shall gather it, gather what? Gather the wealth. All these ungodly people, gather the wealth for him that will pity the poor. Now listen up now. Somehow it is God's law that all the ungodly people who gather wealth, somehow in God's economy, they will fall into the hands of those who pity the poor. Not immediately, as in all schemes of God. Had that rich young ruler listened to Jesus Christ, although outwardly it seems that he had to give up everything, but God will see to it that he will be richly blessed. Not just in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. Even in this world where troubles brew, God will see to it that all his needs will be amply supplied. Not only that, he'll literally enjoy life. Because a person who hoards wealth for wealth's sake never enjoys himself. Do you know that? If I'm addressing to some hoarders, I beg you, listen to Jesus Christ. Begin to live with a view of blessing other people as well. Now, as we read on, you'll be very shocked at the next revelation, but it's all in the Word of God. Okay? Now we come to verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we have left all and have followed thee. What was Peter trying to say? After, immediately after that conversation with the rich young ruler, who shook his head sadly and left, obviously not wanting to take heed. And then they were having this conversation about it's almost impossible for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God, particularly the one who hoards well. But Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. At that point, Peter said, Lord, we left everything. We have followed you. What was he trying to say? You see, sometimes people dare not say everything. But it's enough for you to read in between the lines. Peter was trying to say, we left everything. What do we get? That was what he was trying to say. And Jesus knew the heart. So Jesus uh, replied according to what was in the heart. Because if Jesus were to reply according to his words, we have left all and have followed thee. If Jesus did not know the intention of the heart, Jesus would say, good luck. <laughs> so you get nothing, you know what I mean? But Jesus saw the heart. What is in it for me? We, we follow you. You told that young ruler to follow, take up the cross and follow you. That's exactly what we are doing. So, what now? 29, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, that means truly I say unto you, I don't lie, this is the truth. And what is the truth? There is no man that hath left house. Now remember, Peter, John, James, all the other disciples did not sell away their houses. They only left to go on their evangelistic tour with Jesus. Could they go back? Yeah, their wives were still there. So did they sell the houses? No. So Jesus knew. Jesus said, No man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, only left, didn't sell, left, for the purpose of preaching the gospel, for my sake and the gospels. Listen, Verse 30, but he shall receive an hundredfold, lest you think it's in the sweet by and by. A hundredfold now, lest 
you still don't get it. In this time, are you listening? No man who has left their houses and lands and their family members to preach the gospel, but shall receive a hundredfold now, in this time, in this lifetime, that is, now. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, and children, and lands. There's only one clause with persecutions. If you are in a ministry, there, there will be all kinds of persecution. People will badmouth you, criticize you, falsely accuse you. You will have all kinds of problems, not your own, but others, with persecutions. See, now, and in the world to come. Well, now, this is in a sweet by and by now, okay? There's a differentiation, so you understand. In the, in the world to come, eternal life, and also eternal rewards, I'm very sure. Do you get the perspective now? Isn't it very amazing? I tell you one of the persecutions that faithful preachers and pastors and evangelists have received is this. When they started out poor, no credibility. They said, if God is true, how come my pastor is so poor? When he shifts to a, a house, he would announce, if you, don't, if you have furniture that you want to throw away, can you give it to me? But he served the rich God. So he's misunderstood. But like I said, you're going to start poor, but you don't have to stay poor. And then when a pastor is faithful for 30, 40 years, and God has blessed him, and he's better off than an average person in the congregation, they say, look at him, pastor. He's well off than most of us. If he's a true servant of God, how can he have so much? You see? So this is one of the persecution. Till he loses, head he also loses. But that's not all. There are a lot of persecution. But the promise of God can never be ero revoked. Can never. It says here very clearly that no servant of God who has left all these things behind for a while to preach the gospel but shall receive a hundred fold of all these things. Listen carefully as I close. When you are serious about your spiritual health and when you are serious about your eternal wealth, your financial health will take care of itself. If you get it, it's worth more than one billion dollars to you. And the guarantee doesn't come from me, from God Almighty himself. Let's all rise. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. As we bow our heads, I want everyone to just search your heart. Recalibrate your heart and adjust your heart. And ask yourself, where is my heart today? Is Jesus number one in my life? Or material wealth, possession, money, my God? And if you are not sure, I want you to pray and say, Lord, I enthrone you. You help me. I just enthrone you. I want to make sure you are number one. And I know everything will fall into place. And begin to rededicate your life to the Lord. 
Let your heart be in the right place this morning. Father, I pray as all the lighters adjust your hearts to enthrone you again. You be Lord to them, O oh God. You take care of them because they belong to you. Lord, we give you praise. And Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me. Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, Ruler of my heart. Thank you for joining us online. If you have been blessed and would like to give a love offering to our ministry, you may do so via PayNow or internet banking. You may also mail us your checks at the address below. To keep up to date with us, do follow Pastor Ronnie at the following social media platforms. See you again, same time, next week.